she is part of our uh, series with the Center for Financial Security with Mike uh, there. And um, I'll say a little bit about her in a minute. Uh, the talk, as you can see, is about financial security for low income people. And um, Carolyn Reed, it's the last in that series on May 2nd or something. Anyway. Next week is the last person in our series, and it's Andy Cherland, a very famous and well known um, demographer and sociologist, who will be here to talk about family structure changes and how it affects stability. And so I know there should be a crowd for that. Anyway, here's Jane today. I've known Jane for quite a while, particularly in her work in the unbanked. If you want to know something about people who weren't banked, there are two people to talk to John Caskey at Swarthmore. And Gene, because they know everything about the unbanked. And there's still a lot of people out there without banks and so forth. Uh, but Gene's much, much broader than that. She's, a, um, I should say, right from the beginning, that um, she is also the senior scholarly advisory. Chief. You're, you are on the senior scholarly advisory board for the Center for Financial Security. Look at, look at him. I know. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just a member I just of, show up. I'm under the same it. thing, but that's not my role. Right. Okay. You're the advisor. I'm a. What am I? I'm two. Okay. Anyway. Uh, but the Center for Financial Security is really growing and doing lots of interesting things, and part of it is a series. And so we have Gene here. Um, Gene manages uh, the Consumer Education Research Section of the Division of Consumer and Community Affairs at the Federal Reserve Board. She taught at Cornell before that. Um, she taught high school. Um, <laughs> And she has a numerous, numerous articles essentially on consumer education programs and how consumers understand things like financial literacy. So, Jean, welcome to the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, the usual deal is to go from now until about 1.30, and then we have a reception. It's a reception day. Um, we don't have many eaters here. Eaters are people you see at the seminars who only come to eat. Okay. You still have a lot of eaters in other places. So the, the food's available here in town, I guess, because we don't have a lot of eaters. Um, anyway, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, please go ahead and uh, you can decide how you want to handle questions. Um, okay. And talk about. okay. Well, I'm, I'm happy to take questions as they come up. Um, but let me, and, at Cornell, um, and I don't know, Michael, if, we, if you had this, we had what we call, lovingly called the 20 minute rule. Is let me at least get through 20 minutes, and then, and then you can start asking questions. Uh, sure. If there's something really, really burning that you're just like dying to know, um, you go ooh, 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 and up. You know, we'll, we can always make exceptions. These are not hard and fast rules. Um, I need to start out with saying two things. Um, number one, I need to acknowledge that some of the data that I'm going to be showing um, couldn't have possibly been um, sort of pulled together and distilled without the help of Casey Bell and Matt Gross, um, who um, are both research assistants with us. Um, Casey has moved onward and upward and is now a real, I'll put that in quotes, Fed employee um, with a real job and, and a, a real career path. Um, Matt is still my RA, so there you go. Um, the other disclosure I have is that um, everything I say here today is just gene. It is not um, a reflection of any opinions of the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve Banks, or their staff. This is your standard federal government disclaimer, that it's just me. You know, you may be thinking you're getting somebody big, but it's just Gene. Okay. Um, I also want to do a shameless commercial um, right at the very beginning. Um, many of you may know that in Washington we have the Financial Literacy and Education Commission. This is a, a commission made up of 22 different federal agencies dedicated to financial education. And one of the tasks of the commission is to have a strategic plan. And this is the new strategic plan that was um, just launched last fall. And you can see that there are four key goals that we have as a national strategy for um, economic empowerment and um, capacity building. And they are to increase the awareness and effectiveness of financial education, to determine and integrate core financial competencies, and actually you're going to see those in a little bit, um, to improve financial education infrastructure, and to identify, enhance, and share um, effective practices. And we lovingly refer to that last one as the research bucket. So many of you will sort of identify with that. Um, and so you. 
you may not ever hear of this again, but know that in fact there really is a national strategy for financial capability out there, and we really are trying to sort of help, you know, have that rising tide lift all boats. Um, I'm going to be very Stephen Covey here and begin with the end in mind, and and basically tell you my results, um, and we can then sort of talk about some of these. We'll come back to them later on and move back. But um, in all the work that we have done with these data, um, one of the, these are the kind of the big takeaways. Number one, the role of parents is very, very key in the financial management capabilities of other Americans, of other, other people in our studies at least. Um, you know, so if you want somebody to have a good foundation, it helps to educate the parents so that they can give that child the good foundation. And I swear to God, Tim, this was already on my slides before breakfast this morning. Okay. Um, human capital really, really matters. And you're going to see the effect of education again and again and again in our data. Um, no matter how much we slice and dice the data. The kids with the GED and then the less than high school don't come off as well as those with high school, with some college, or with an associate or four-year degree. Um, so, you know, learning how to learn matters here. And any policy that we can do that keeps kids in school, that retain kids, that encourages kids to invest in human capital, is really, really important. Of course, here I am in the university saying this stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. But that's really, really very important. Experiences matter. And I know that a colleague of mine, Vanessa Perry, wrote a paper talking about learning from the School of Hard Knocks. Um, but one of the things we find, in, even in our data with young people, is even the experience of having a bank account in high school, growing up, really, really matters, and it somehow is correlated with good financial management behaviors. Now, correlation is not causation, but you know, to the extent that we can get people access and get them engaged and involved in, in mainstream financial services, I think that's going to be very important. Here's a shocker, income matters. The more money you have, the better money manager you are. And again, it's, it's correlational. I'm not sure what, which causes what, chicken, egg. But you're going to see clearly those soldiers in the higher pay grades are doing better. They just have, have more capabilities, more, more um, financially savvy behaviors. I will explain to you a little bit more about how we structured this study, but the punchline for this particular section right now is that <coughs> financial education has to be relevant. And that's sort of a no-brainer if you have any kind of education training, whether it is K-12 or adult learning theory, you know that relevance is really, really important. And what we're going to see in our soldiers is that um, teaching about insurance and credit and retirement wasn't nearly as impactful as teaching about how to buy a car. And you know, if you're an 18-year-old on a military installation and you're really worried about how, how much are those spinners? And does anybody in here know what a spinner is? Okay, what's a spinner? A spinner is, it, it basically keeps the, it's hard to describe, thing on the, on the tire, it just spins faster. and It, look, it looks kind of interesting if you spend a lot of money on it. Right, so so spinner is like it's like a, something you attach to your wheel, and when you're you're rolling forward, it's rolling forward with you, and you, when you're stopping, the momentum keeps going, and the spinner keeps spinning. And the one of our soldiers said, "I learned not to spend more on your spinners than your monthly rent." Okay, <laughs> that's good. You know, we'll take anything we can get. Um, and then um, finally. Another sort of re what really matters is access, access to financial services. For young people especially, convenience is key. Any little barrier just seems to get in the way of them moving forward in terms of um, signing up for things, automating things, doing things. So automation becomes important here. And, and I know that this is um, against uh, um, sort of the gospel that the Center for Financial Services Innovation and Consumer Federation of America preaches, 
but anything you can automate, automate savings, um, is, is really very, very important. And let me just tell you, um, last Friday, the Center for Financial Services Innovation and the National Endowment for Financial Education hosted an event on Capitol Hill, and they were talking about innovative programs. And one of the programs that they have sponsored is a, um, a, a, an initiative with Piggy Mojo, I can't, swear I can't make that up, Piggy Mojo, and Brooklyn um, Federal Credit Union. Brooklyn Federal Credit Union is a community development credit union. And um, the deal there is that when you go into a store and you don't spend money, you text Piggy Mojo and you say, um, I didn't spend 350 on a coffee or a latte. And Piggy Mojo emails you back and says, or texts you back and says, great job, Gene, congratulations for you. You just saved 350. Um, it also texts Jean's husband, Randy, and Randy gets a message that said, Jean just saved 350 on a latte. And Randy can write me back and say, well, duh, you know, or something like that. <laughs> but the other thing it does is it moves $3.50 from my transactional account into my savings account. So mm. it isn't just not spending the 350, it is truly saving the 350. Um, that is that automation part of, of, of trying to remove barriers and getting people to engage in some of these behaviors that we really, really want. Okay, so now I've sort of told you everything and we can go just over to the buffet and, <laughs> and have, have the reception. Um, all right, let me talk to you a little bit about our study and the data. Um, I'm going to talk about, we actually use, I'm going to present information from two different data sets. Um, one is a Federal Reserve Board Army Emergency Relief, that's AER. Um, AER sponsored a two-day financial education course for soldiers um, at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. And this was taught by San Diego City College. Um, they have a contract with the Navy to teach this financial education course to Navy sailors. And so AER just said, hey, you're already doing it. You're doing it for the Navy. You may as well do it for the Army. Um, and what, what San Diego does is they go out and they recruit ex-retired military, generally um, uh, non-com officers. So um, command sergeant majors, sergeant majors, um, master sergeants, anybody in that sort of higher rank that sort of is, it comes from the same body of experience that the soldiers are coming from. So that there is a kindred spirit and a sort of sense that I know what you're going through. Those, and they train them up on this financial education course. And then these, these folks fact, come into a classroom and sit down and do this course. The course was taught on um, two consecutive Saturdays. During the week, the, uh, these guys are, are involved in, in training. AIT stands for Advanced Individualized Training. And this is the training that comes right after basic training. So you go through your basic training, you get assigned to your military occupation specialty, and then you do the advanced individualized training in your specialty. And all our guys, and they were 85% guys, were um, uh, uh, Army Air Defense. And these are the guys that launched the Patriot missiles. So you know, these are the missiles, rocket guys. Um, not rocket scientists, but rocket guys, okay. Um, so this is a two-day course with under a, a, a very consistent teaching um, format. Our goals for the initial study were to sort of look and see whether the financial education program actually made a difference. Um, and then to also look at what other factors might affect financial management behaviors. And again, sort of to give you the, the punchline here, where it mattered was budgeting. Soldiers learned to set a spending plan up. And um, it was, for many of these fellows, this was the first regular paycheck they had. You're going to see in a minute our sample is largely 18 to 23. Think about who enlists in the military and where they are in their military career. They've just come out of basic training, right? So, this is their first regular paycheck. These are newly independent youth. 
These are, you could think of them as youth aging out of the foster care system. You could think of them as the freshmen in your classes that are, you know, and without the paychecks. <laughs> um, they were, it made a difference in helping them understand discretionary, non-discretionary spending. What do I really have, what bills do I really have to set aside money for and really understand what's, um, what's committed money versus what is fun money. Um, as I already indicated, the relevance of financial education matters, it mattered in teaching them about car buying and car maintenance and ownership. It also mattered in contributing to the Thrift Savings Plan, the TSP. And the reason that's lightly grayed out there is that um, I think that there is a, a mechanism in going on in place here that really is not financial education. It is one of those more behavioral economics things that we simply provided them the form and because it was convenient for them to sign up, it wasn't that they were convinced of the importance of the time value of money and how if I start saving at 18 for my retirement, I'm going to be a millionaire when I'm 65. It was, here's a form, sign it. Okay, I did that, you know. So I heard Dick Thaler say, if you really want people to sign up for their, their thrift savings plan, you bring them into a room, you can show them Simpson videos and give them the form, and they'll all sign up. If you teach them all about financial education and the importance of the time value of money and compounding, and, and then you send them back to their desks to sign up online, they'll get back to their offices, and the phone will be ringing, and they'll be checking their emails, and they'll never sign up. So, so I'm not so sure about this contributing to the TSP part. Why didn't the financial education piece matter more? And you know, many of us in the field really, really struggle with this. We really believe that financial education matters, but it's very, very hard for us to prove that. And I, you know, you, there are the usual litany of, of um, suspects in the room here. It's measurement error that we didn't capture them at the right stage of behavior change, those of you who are familiar with the trans-theoretical model. They're moving from the pre-contemplation to contemplation, or the contemplation to action stage, and we haven't, we caught them at time zero and time zero plus t, and there's a lot of slippage in the zero plus t time frame. If we could have measured them more continuously, things might have been more clear. Um, it might be just the timing of when we caught them in the surveys, that, that um, we hadn't allowed enough time for behavior changes to occur. And that's, you know, one of the things with financial management. Just like weight loss, you don't lose weight overnight, you don't become wealthy overnight. And, and allowing for time to, to lapse to see some of these effects of behavior change is really important. There, is, there are some things that we might actually blame I'll put that in quotes, on the course. Um, this was, as I said, on two consecutive Saturdays. These guys had been learning how to fire rockets Monday through Friday, and they're being told by their drill sergeant that they've got to come in on Saturday morning at 0900 and put their butt in the chair and pay attention for six hours. Well, you know what students are like in your classrooms, okay? On a Saturday, their quotes day off. So, you know, that might not have been great. The content, as I've mentioned several times already, relevancy, relevancy, relevancy. I'm not so sure just, you know, if there, if there was a way for us to sort of tweak the course content, maybe we could have found some more effects. Um, there is also this issue of pedagogy, format, and teacher effectiveness. Although it was a set curriculum, and although all the teachers were trained similarly, you know that there is variability across instructors. You all, this was a, just like I'm doing right now, stand up in front of you with PowerPoints and lecture kind of class. There was limited interaction. There was the classes that I sat in. There was, there was Q&A, but there was no small group. Here's a, here's a case study. You four people pull together and work on it. You six people pull together and work on it. None of that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, if, if we had different teaching activities, would it have made a, a difference? We don't know. The other thing is that there were no tests on this to sort of signal what's important. You came into the class, you took the course, and you left. And we never said, you're going to be evaluated on this. Well, you know what your students are like. If it's not on the test, do I have to learn it, right? Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's, partly signaling that, yeah, this is for your own benefit, 
But how much benefit is it, again, on a Saturday morning in El Paso, Texas, after I was out drinking with my buddies on Friday night? So who knows why it didn't matter more. There's a number of possible hypotheses there. Let me talk to you a little bit about our data collection. Um, we literally did a census of every soldier who went through the financial education program. So our baseline data, we have baseline data on over 4,000 soldiers. Um, we then did a follow-up anywhere from 6 to 18 months after the course, and that was done by us physically going back to Fort Bliss, having um, certain units detailed to come into a theater and take a paper and pencil test, and then matching um, the, the before and after tests based on, um, on names. And the Fed never learned those names. Um, we had a third party contractor who did all the matching for us. So out of those 4,000 soldiers, um, we did that twice. We did the, the theater thing twice. And we were only able to find 199 matches um, with the second round surveys with our first round soldiers. So one of the, the, the challenges that, that longitudinal surveys face, and you all know this here, is how do you do that follow-up? How do you keep getting those soldiers, those, those people, for the second round surveys? Um, you would have thought that the Army knew where these guys were. And we actually tried to do a mail survey to the, the folks, and we had, we, we just, we stopped counting after 300, but we had 300 returned surveys where the, we, the, our, the address that the Army had was not the right address. So it's a little scary. <laughs> um, we also had a comparison group of 293 soldiers who did not go through the survey, uh, the, the financial ed course, but who did get detailed to come into those theaters and, and, and do the paper and pencil survey. It means that the education group was a group that selected to show up Saturday morning. Right. And the comparison group didn't show up Saturday morning. The comparison group is, is other people who were newly detailed to Fort Bliss, oh. but who were not there for AIT, and who did not therefore take the financial education course. Okay, so there's, uh, they could have selected in possibly if they were offered it, but the offering was through the prior group. The, uh, right, they, yeah. Now, they could have had financial education through, let's say, an Army Community Services, you know, site on campus or something like that, but they were not offered this, or their sergeant did not tell them, show up at 0900 in this building. Yeah. So it is not, this is not random, a randomized treatment control group. They're not a control group, they're only a comparison group. Okay. Um, the questionnaire had stuff about demographics, about their pre-military history, um, the financial products and services they own, their behaviors and activities, attitudes, financial self-assessment, sort of the usual cast of characters. The other data set that I'm going to be showing you today is a, a data set that was collected by the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority Education Foundation, or FINRA. Um, they did an online <coughs> survey of military households. It was 800 um, service members and their spouses. All right, so this is ours is just service members, FINRA service members and spouses. And theirs was an online survey, ours was paper and pencil. FINRA also has conducted a state-by-state -state survey. And um, the, so one of the, the takeaways for you is there is a Wisconsin State FINRA survey out there that you could go out, download the data, and, and look at the, the financial capability behaviors of Wisconsinites out there. And um, it's very, very interesting um, to, to sort of go and do that and then benchmark them against the U.S. or benchmark them against other Midwestern states. The state-by-state um, -state data can be aggregated and the, um, FINRA pro provides you with a weight that allows you to weight the data up to national aggregates so that it's not just, you know, you know and I know that 500 people in Montana is different than 500 people in New York, right? So, um, so um, so in order to benchmark our Army data with some other data that from the military and from other young household data, I'm drawing on these other two surveys from FINRA. 
And so we're making some comparisons within our data set, looking at the baseline and the follow-up, looking at the baseline with the comparison group, the follow-up with the comparison group. With the FINRA data, we can compare the young military to all military to um, young non-military households on the state-by-state -state survey. And then um, you know, we can look at young military and young non-military um, across surveys. So lots of opportunities for compare and contrast kinds of things. Let me, before I actually show you some of the numbers, let me give you just some real quick stylized facts about these surveys. Our survey, the Federal Reserve Army Emergency Release Survey, really was young people, 18 to 23. Um, they were, as I've mentioned before, 85% male. Um, our sample has very limited education. Three-fifths of our soldiers are high school or GED. The other two-fifths are more or less? Um, more. More. Um, Army won't take you without a GED. Okay. And you can talk to some... We, we had did some very interesting interviews with um, the um, unit lieutenants and with the battalion majors, very, very interesting about their perceptions of um, the, new, the new enlisted in, in the all-volunteer army. Um, just to give you some baseline about sort of how does this all fit into <coughs> low-income households, um, let me just tell you that E1s, and E1s are the, the, the first raw recruits. Um, they are the, 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 it's the grade you get, pay grade you get when you go into boot camp, earn 14 about fourteen fifty a month, which um, works out to seventeen thousand four hundred a year. Um, our soldiers in AIT were um, some were E still E one, some had become E twos by that point in time, and E four, which is um, the last of the, the private ranks before you start going into the non commissioned officer, um, the sergeant ranks, um, earn um, just under two thousand a month. So just under 24,000 with two to three years experience of service in the, in the military. So that's kind of why, you know, these are really are low-income households. Now. So they get room and board and. Yeah. Right, right. They do, some of these, these soldiers, I mean, it is, you know, sort of three hots in a cot kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so they do have room and board. They get one uniform, but they have to pay for all their other uniforms. Many of these soldiers had the off-campus apartment because they had girlfriends. And rather than stay at their girlfriends, they had their own place. Um, many of these soldiers, you'll see, had vehicles. And for an 18 to 21-year-old young man in the military, let me just tell you that your insurance monthly payment is more than your car monthly payment. So, um, so this is kind of, when we're talking about the, the kinds of audiences that, that you are talking about with respect to at-risk, low-income, um, these are, this is sort of, these are the guys that are out there wearing <coughs> Patriot missiles. Oh my God. Um, I mentioned in my, my shameless commerce division of, of Car Talk slide that um, uh, one of the, the issues, one of the, the, the goals, uh, one of the strategies is to make use and develop core competencies to identify what does it mean to be financially capable in, in the 21st century. And um, the great minds that have put their heads together on this have identified these five factors of earning, spending, saving, borrowing, and protecting. And so what I want to show you a little bit is how some of our soldiers stacked up on these core competencies. And the data that I'm going to be showing you are where we can do comparisons across both the AER survey and the FINRA surveys. Um, but in the paper that I'll be providing to the Institute for Research in Poverty and Michael, um, we, we have a, a broader array of, of variables that we look at, um, mainly because you know our survey asks some questions, FINRA asks some different questions. Fortunately, there were some, and there were enough sort of comparable ones where we could sort of look across all surveys. Okay, I did not look at income because um, you know, everybody sort of has the same income in our surveys, so we're sort of leaving that aside. But in terms of spending, um, we asked whether or not you bounced a check 
ever. And let me, the other thing I also have to say is, in the military, everybody is paid by direct deposit. So everybody is banked <coughs> in the military survey. Okay? Um, if you look at the FINRA studies, what I've done there is I've broken the FINRA <coughs> studies out into all military, which is everybody, they had everybody from an E1 all the way through to an E9, which is your command sergeant majors. And then they had officers. So they had everyone from lieutenants up to, um, they had some brigadier generals in their survey. And remember, they had military spouses. So those, that all military column is a little fuzzier. And I just want to warn you about that. The other thing is, is that we were not, their age categories weren't the same as our age categories. So the best we could do in, in um, matching up age categories was to look at 18 to 29, whereas, as I've already told you, ours are more like 18 to 23. So um, some of these guys fall into that, that upper 20 category span. But you can see, actually, they're fairly similar in terms of whether they've bounced a check whether they own a vehicle. Um, actually, the FINRA studies show higher rates of vehicle ownership among the military than ours do. But notice um, for the um, the state-by-state state survey, when we compare them with 18 to 24-year-olds generally, vehicle ownership is, is really quite low. And that's sort of what you would expect, I think. Um, where I have it yellowed out, that basically means that there is a statistically significant difference bivariate, just bivariate, in, um, for example, the difference between the baseline group and the comparison group in bouncing a check. So in other words, when the soldiers first came into the, the financial education class, we sat them down with a survey before they actually started talking about the class, about financial education. About 3 in 10 had said they had bounced a check. In the comparison group, it was nearly half. Now, I can explain that very simply because these guys have been in the Army maybe about three months. They've only gotten a paycheck for about three months. They may not have had very much opportunity to bounce a check. Notice that in the follow-up survey, by the time they've been in the Army a year or a year and a half, they've had many more opportunities to start bouncing checks. Um, so um, the, the, the vehicle ownership, there is a difference between the baseline and the follow-up, between the follow-up and the comparison group. So um, you see sort of increasing rates of, um, of vehicle ownership. And again, that probably is, is more of an, an issue of the time and the uh, opportunity to go out and buy a car. But I'm also going to show you data later on that really basically says but our guys actually behaved differently. They had more of a down payment. They bought, they got a better deal on their vehicle loans. In terms of savings, um, again, you can see the data about 70%, um, 70 percent, 70 between 70 and 80 percent said they have a savings account. Um, about a third said they have an emergency fund. This is a little different than the FINRA study, which showed that 95 percent said they had a savings account and half had they said, said they had an emergency fund. Um, when we asked them about their thrift savings 401k plans, and this was 401k for the state-by-state um, the -state study, um, you'll notice that the baseline, only 13% had signed up in basic training for uh, their, their thrift savings plan. By the follow-up study, you know, again, the piece of paper had been put in front of them, and they had, about a third had signed up compared with only about a quarter in the comparison group. Um, notice what it is in the FINRA military study. It's, it's you know, fully seven out of 10, three quarters are participating in the thrift savings plan. I will also tell you that the Army statistically is, no, well, the Army is notorious for having the lowest pickup rate on the thrift savings plan. The Navy virtually has 100% uh, participation. So it, it varies by service branches. The other thing I should tell you about the FINRA military is that it's all service branches. And it actually includes beyond the Army, a Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps. It also includes the Coast Guard and the Public Health Service, which is also a uniform service. And the first 3% is matched, right? 
Um, yeah. Like it's a mistake not to do it. Right, right, right. It's money on the It's table. not like a 401k where it's, I mean, it's, it's quite different when you're age 18 to go into a 401k versus a thrift savings plan because at one point you get your money matched for the first 3% of your salary. Right, right. And, and it, that does, I don't think it's, I'm, I'm surprised that only 20% of 18 to 24 year olds are doing it because again, many of these folks are not yet in the labor force and wouldn't even have an opportunity. So if we conditioned on being a worker, that number might go up a little bit, but I, I don't know. Um, let me just point out the, the irony here that in our survey, 70% said they had a savings account, but only a third said they had an emergency fund. And so you're saying, well, what's the money in your savings account? Yeah. And so this, to me, is a little bit of sort of behavioral economics at its best with people doing this mental accounting of saying, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got money in the bank, but it's not really an emergency fund. It's something else. I don't know. The other hypothesis here is that um, CFA did a survey a while ago, and they basically asked people, how much money do you think you need in your emergency fund? And the answer was generally in the $1,500 to $2,000 range. And we already know that for young people, and for certainly you know, the 18 to 23 year olds, bank balances are very, very low. They're probably under $500. And so if I think that I need $1,500 and I only have $500, am I gonna, how do I answer the question of do you have an emergency fund? Well, not yet. You know, I'm, I'm working on building it up. I'm, and so this is a, another one of those maybe could have asked a better or different question. In terms of borrowing, um, uh, these are very interesting comparisons across these two different <laughs> survey groups. Um, again, our folks, my argument would be, they haven't had the opportunity yet to get a credit card, to get into trouble with a credit card, even though it's fascinating to me that a third have already paid a light fee on credit cards. Um, the reason I believe that we see 90% of the FINRA military folks having credit cards is that, as those of you may know, in addition to requiring that we get direct deposit, government workers are required to have a government credit card because that's how we get all our travel stuff, right? So all my, when I, when I fly here, I charge it on my government credit card. And um, so, do, you know, we never, again, it's the, the, the wrong question. Do you have a personal credit card in addition to the government credit card that's been issued to you? So if you want to know more about how to ask re these survey questions, especially with military, I am volunteering to co consult with you free because there's a, there's a very interesting set of, of little details. Um, again, a large portion of our soldiers in our survey didn't have a vehicle loan yet, but we would expect that over time they would, and, and that's not, again, sort of a surprise. Um, another way to think about borrowing is the use of the alternative financial services, and that's what AFS stands for. Um, and so one of the questions, the key questions is, are you using payday loans? Are you using pawn shop? Are you using title loans? And title pawn loans are where you literally pawn the title to your car. The pawn shop holds the, the vehicle title and gives you money. And car title pawn is illegal in some states. I don't, is it legal here in Wisconsin? We just ban title loans. Okay. So one of the things you have to know is title loans are, in fact, legal in Texas. Um, but when you look at the FINRA studies, we would actually have to control for state to learn, again, conditioned on whether or not your state allowed title pawn, are you pawning the, your, your vehicle title? Um, here, one of the, the, the lessons learned, I think, we take away from this is two things. Number one, you know, you hear all about payday loans and how awful it is for military. And our survey, our study, didn't show that there was very much going on there. But again, these are very young GIs. They just haven't had trouble, a chance to get into trouble. Therefore, they haven't had a chance to start using these, these products. When you look at the FINRA data, you start to see a little bit more of that, that, that payday lending, um, uh, pawn shop lending, title loan lending. Um, the FINRA survey also asks about RALs, 
refund anticipation loans. And you'll see there's, there's a lot of data there that show that, in fact, the, the service members are making use of this, this avenue for um, financial services. And again, it's an interesting question as to if you have money in a savings account and you're using payday lending or and you're using pawn shop, why aren't you tapping the money in your savings account? Is there how are you thinking about that money in savings? Gene, it would be good to know how many people are counted twice there. So in other words, you probably can't just add it up that there could be people who have payday loans and pawn shop loans and maybe even title loans. So It'd be useful to see if there's a small part of the population which participates in a bunch of them rather than, I mean, it, it, I, that's a question that comes up from my mind anyway from seeing this. Right, sort of like how, how, how deeply embedded are they? Right, if know? somebody is, you know, is in trouble and you can't get enough from the payday loan, then you pawn and then maybe even car title or whatever. And, and so it'd be good to know how many did one of these and how many did more than one. Right. And the idea. other the other question we didn't ask was, um, you know, kind of how many payday loans did you take out? Have you are you a regular user or is this a I did it once. Uh, my 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 complaint with the FDIC um, unbanked survey, un, an underbanked survey is they ask you have, the, well in the original survey they asked have you ever t used a money order? Well I got to tell you in Washington D.C. Um, when I travel internationally, I literally go to the embassy to get my visas, and the only payment embassies will take is money orders. So if you ask me, have you, have you gotten a money order, I would say, yeah. So I, FDIC would think that I'm underbanked, and believe me, I would never count myself as underbanked. So I think it's this occasional use versus regular use and those kinds of things. I think you're right. We need to start tweaking that out of our data. A the other bit. one is friends or family. Because, I mean, the old PSID question and everything, you have a source of help if you get in trouble, and most people say they do, and mainly financial trouble, so you can, an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a father, a parent, you'd like to know if they, if they tried to tap those and if, or if those were available. Right. And in our, um, in the Fed Survey of Consumer Finances, which is the triennial, triennial study that we do, there is a question in that survey about you know, if you needed three thousand dollars, is there somebody that you could borrow that from? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have been quoted as saying that I believe some of this is, you know, eighty percent psychology and only twenty percent economics, and I really do believe that attitudes matter, and I think we're seeing this a lot in, in other studies, that you know, people think they're a better, better money manager than they really are. Um, that they, um, they say that they read and keep up with the financial news, but then if you ask them something about inflation or compound interest or, or any of the sort of the Anna Maria Lusardi type questions, they sort of fail pretty miserably. And um, it's, it's just interesting to me that, in fact, um, in our follow-up study, the proportion of folks who considered themselves good money managers once they knew what they didn't know, went down. And there is this issue of you don't know what you don't know. And so there's a, a kind of, again, a, an interesting <coughs> issue from research perspective is how do, you, how do you ask those kinds of questions in a pre versus post kind of framework? Um, so one of the things we did with these data, with our data, and now I'm going to sort of set aside the FINRA data for a while and just talk about our AER data, um, is we had a litany of good financial behaviors and a litany of bad financial behaviors, and we sort of chunked those into um, high, middle, and low, how many of these things did you do? So we aggregated. And then we looked at your aggregate behaviors on, hot, on good things and your aggregate behaviors on bad things. And obviously what we want people is we want people to be in a high good, low bad behavior box over there on the lower right. And we don't want them to be in that high bad, low good behavior box. And so we want them to be in the green box, not in the red box. And so when we did kind of <coughs> chunk these data in our, with our sample, what we found is that we had about 10% in that red box, about 11% in the green box, and everybody else in the middle. And not, not unexpected, I think. Um, but then we sort of asked, 
what are the correlates of these? Who, who sort of fits into these boxes? Are there things that we can say about the green people versus the yellow people versus the red people, right? And one of the, the things, remember I said early on that parental influence really matters? And what we found is that if you were aware of your parents' finances growing up, you had a higher probability of being in that high, good, low, bad box to the tune of 13% versus 5% for people who were not aware. And the, the, the things that I'm sharing with you now are statistically significant in a, in a multiple, uh, multivariate regression sort of framework. So these are, uh, these are real um, effects. These are not just bivariate effects. Um, I mentioned the importance of early experience, whether you had a high school savings account. And if you did, you had a 14% probability of being in that good box compared with only a 6% probability for um, those who had no experience with high school savings. So early, early experiences matter. We also um, had a stress index that, that we've used. And it's a combination of the, the Tom Garman stair step measure and um, a couple other sort of questions that, that they have used um, um, in the, um, the personal finance employee education website, you can get these questions. And what we found is that higher stress was associated with a higher probability of being in that red box, and lower stress was associated with higher probability of being in the green box. Um, again, no, no big surprises there. But what type of stress are you measuring? Um, the word stress can mean a lot of different things. Right, right, right. Financial so, stress. Height stress? Health stress? Um, no, it was not health stress. Um, it was questions like, how do you feel about your family's financial condition over the past six months? And that was on a five-point scale. How would you relate your, your financial stress on a scale of one to 10, where um, one is low and 10 is so overwhelming? Stress. Yeah. Um, how frequently do you find yourself living from paycheck to paycheck, again, on a scale of one to 10? One being rarely, 10 being frequently. So financial stress. Um, I told my husband, I don't know what to make of this. <laughs> um, people who were married were much more likely to be in that high good, low bad box than people who were not married. And you know, we can make the example of, or we can <coughs> talk to, about the example of a richer pool of household resources, and we see that in other, you know, non-military households. You know, if you're if you're in a two-earner household and one person loses their job, you still have one income coming in. If you're in a one-earner household and that person loses his job, you have no income coming in. And so, the ability to sort of um, uh, shift resources around in a, in, a, in a married couple situation is is, I think, very relevant. Um, I will also put a plug in here because one of the interesting things that one of the professional organizations is doing is they are training military spouses as certified financial counselors. Um, um, there is this um, CFC designation that the Association for Financial Counseling and Planning Education gives. And this is a portable designation that as you travel from Fort Bliss to Fort Sill to Fort Drum, you know, as a military spouse, you can continue to be engaged in the community in doing financial counseling and financial education. So an interesting sort of, of, of approach there. Um, as I said earlier, and it's, it's a duh kind of thing, but income really does matter. And here we're using pay grade or salary grade as the proxy for income. And again, you can see if you're an E5 or more, and again, this is now, this is the, 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 the first sergeant level you have a 21% chance of being in that high, good, low, bad category compared with um, an E5, an E1 or an E2 that only has a 5% or a 9% chance of being in that category. Interestingly, I was, um, one of the, um, the, the majors we were interviewing was saying, it's not the E5s you gotta worry about, it's the E6s and E7s because at that point, those young men are marrying and starting to have kids, and they're trying to have two or three kids, and they do it on one salary. 
and that's when the pinch really comes. And so it's that resource drain that, that you know, you, you might be, well, resource not drain, but resource demand, let's call it. Gee, is this that's controlling for income and age and marital status? This is, this is again, regression. So this is just the pure beta on pay grade. Um, education matters. And as I said, you know, everybody in the Army has at least a GED. Um, but if you've got that two-year or four-year degree, you are much more likely to be in the high, good, low, bad box. 21% probability compared with only 8% of those, um, those folks with just the high school or GED designation. And again, here it's that, in part, the learning to learn. Um, I mentioned that, that we wanted, I wanted to dive just a little bit deeper into the issue of making education relevant for the audience. And as a good educator, anybody in this room knows that you have to be, you know, learner-driven, learner-relevant educational experiences. And vehicles for these young men and women were, were really the key here. And some of these data are, are replicated from, from previous slides um, in terms of ownership and, and um, having a loan. Um, but you can sort of see the distribution um, in our financial education group between owning and leasing versus the, the distribution in the comparison group. Um, I will just tell you that the military generally does not like vehicle leases because leasing often has restraints on um, where you can move the car. And if you're allowed to drive the car across country, when you are, have been stationed in, Sa in, in San Diego and suddenly your next port of, 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 of uh, posting is in um, Florida or um, Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and it's particularly um, important for um, Navy and Air Force guys who are posted to Hawaii because you are not allowed to take your car off the islands. And these early termination charges can be like $13,000. And, you know, if you're only making 17,000, 23,000, it's, it's really nasty. So um, we can talk later about why Dodd-Frank excluded auto leases and what DOD had to say about that and everything, but never mind that. Um, but what I did want to show you was some other data in, in diving into this that we looked at. If you look at our follow-up group, now remember the follow-up group in this case these were generally soldiers who did not have cars when we first surveyed them, but got cars by the time of the follow-up survey. They had lower amounts of loans. They had put, they had accumulated a higher down payment. Therefore, their sort of their down payment to loan ratio was much higher than the guys who came into the army with a car, or the comparison group of soldiers who didn't have the financial education course. Their loan term was shorter. They, they got that message that, you know, the longer you pay, the more interest you pay. And interestingly, although their monthly payment was a little higher than the, the soldiers in the baseline survey, it was lower than the folks in the comparison group. So they, they, they heard that lesson. They learned about car financing, car shopping, car negotiating. And so there was, there is some, some again, sort of prima facie evidence that the relevancy of the financial education topic really, really can can be effective in, in these kinds of settings. I would standardize all of that for the purchase price of the car, because it looks to me like the follow-up guys just bought better cars. They had more of a down payment, they had better loan term and they're paying more money, so maybe they got, they got a a Camry instead of a Tercel. Well, you'll notice I call this vehicles um, because they're not buying Camrys or Tercels. They're buying F 150s. Sorry, we get trucks. 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 Truckers' trucks. Truckers trucks. Trucking trucks. I was just wondering if it, your data or somebody else's data, um, it's going to sound silly, but I mean it, is there an irrelevant topic to compare it to? I mean, cause, see, when I hear the word relevant, I'm thinking, okay, I can totally see the relevance of the vehicle to these people. I'm thinking, what's less what, relevant? What's irrelevant? I mean, somebody tried to teach them something else, and then look back and say, well, that was dumb. What do they care about this? Diapers or something. <laughs>
Retirement is probably the closest Yeah, most yeah. retirement is probably the closest one. Okay. Actually, insurance was not really exciting to them. So it's of a short-term object versus long-term planning sort of, that would be relevant? Doesn't the military give them life insurance though? Um, some well, yeah, there is some life insurance for the military, and as a matter of fact, one of the quotes negative behaviors that we were ca we, Army Emergency Relief wanted us to to include, was whether or not they bought supplemental life insurance, because mm -hmm. again, the Army considers that a waste of money, and they've they've actually thrown some insurance companies off the the military installations, mm -hmm. because of that. Yes. Sir? Just a, a question: Is follow up completely distinct from baseline, or does it include some of the vehicles that people were still paying on? From baseline. Um, no, we 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 parsed that out. Okay. So these are these are sort of clean test tubes. Yeah. Um, okay. Let let me just um, a couple final parting shots. Recognize that we have this very very limited sample. I mean, our guys our guys eighty five percent male. I have. I had. We briefed. The, um, the Army Emergency Relief National Staff on these, these, this study. And I did a, a slide that had a, a thing that said, you know, um, our soldiers do not equal slash, right, um, general public. And the, the retired general, Congressional Medal of Honor winner, <clears throat> nothing like dissing the top guy, who is head of Army Emergency Relief said, ma'am, I don't ever want to see that language on a slide again. <laughs> we are citizen soldiers, we draw from, and it was like, I'm sorry, sir, 85% of the population is not male. You know, they just aren't. But, so, let me just say, we have a limited sample here. <laughs> um, um, and, they're, and, and they are young. You know, so you can you can think about what other compares what other young groups you might want to compare them to. Um, I've already talked about measurement error, timing, the course implementation, um, the issues of testing to signal what's important, um, and just to sort of close the loop and, and you know reiterate what what we think from looking at these data really really matters are you know parental influences, early experiences education, income, relevant information and education, and access and inclusion. Now, there are a number of policy and educational implications that fall out of these. And, and I think what I would like to do is sort of open this up and, and you know, encourage a discussion about what you see in these data that can give us some insight in Washington as to what we might be doing moving <coughs> forward. Um, and then just let me finally say that I, I have provided you um, a slide that will remain on this PC, and I don't know whose PC this is, but it's there, with hot links to um, papers that we've written that really include all of these data. And it'll be there um, on the, uh, in the paper that, that I give to, to Michael and to Tim. So with that in mind, let me open it up for discussion and let's talk. Yes. Um, actually, what I found very powerful was uh, was the change in behavior of the car the car ownership. If uh, I mean those are you know, young men that are just buying the first car, but if the if the uh, education intervention works the same to maybe an older an older group of people that are buying the first house, they talk about I mean major savings for those for those, for those families. If uh, if the same results of in the, in the car ownership apply for buy the first house, that would be very powerful. Yes, and we would, you know, I mean, it would be great if everybody who was uh, considering becoming a homeowner, um, in fact, sort of sought out, or, or if there was a way to push out financial education to that, that, that group of people. Um, one of the messages I would like to give is that, you know, picking out the house is not the big decision here. Picking out the mortgage is the big decision because your mortgage is going to cost way more than your house um, because of the interest. And any of you who have signed closing papers with those gosh awful federal truth in lending disclosures that say, you know, you're borrowing 100000 but you're paying back 250000 you know, at least, 
Unless you're Tim and you've refinanced for some really, really low price. And cut the number of years from 30 to 15. Very important. Yeah. But. Yeah. Yes. Since on one of your first slides, you have something about discretionary versus non discretionary. And I'm just I'm curious about that. Just to the extent that you explore those, and I, I've got this disclosure I'm a parent of three teenagers. And so we try to have these, these conversations as well in terms of like thinking about budgeting. You know, especially. I don't want to, but younger people these days, you, know, you have a cell phone. How much do you really need? How big is your bill? How can you can so just things like that? I'm wondering to what extent um, you had those kind of conversations with them and how you made inroads into understanding, you know, what are priorities, what are really needs versus things that you don't have to spend your money on. And, and, yeah. and um, in the curriculum that, that they used, um, it, again, it's it's customized for the military, so there's sort of three hots and cots, and you, and you got, you know, army issued fatigues and boots and stuff like that. So there's actually, um, if you think, <laughs> if you think of the army as almost like what freshmen go through in college, you know, it's this transitional phase where you're semi-independent, you're kind of out away from home, but you're there is still some provision of food, clothing, and shelter. And so you still have a little bit of what the literature calls this premature affluence among teens, where it's all discretionary spending, right? Because mom and dad are putting the roof over the head and food on the table. And, and to the extent that you, know, you sort of think about how do you help youth make that transition from dependence to semi-dependence to independence. Um, but so what the curriculum did was it talked about you know um, needs and wants. It talked about um, uh, what are contractual when, when you sign a contract. What does that obligate you to? And under what circumstances are you signing contracts? Like for cell phones, um, the the soldiers at Fort Bliss were also very very susceptible to rent to own. Um, and they were renting to own um, PCs. They were renting to own um, big screen TVs. They were, I swear to God, I am not making this up, they were renting to own rims. The, the things that you put your tires on. And I was, I, who knew that there was a rent to own market in rims? Uh, you did. How did you know that? I'm from Texas. Oh, okay. <laughs> started, you know, I mean, it was, it, again, the relevance, and they, they would talk about, you know, what, what do you really have to spend your money on, what are the needs, what are the wants, those kinds of things. Um, Michael and then when How much of this is tied up in their decision to move off base? And do, you, do they have, to, do they live on base and have a vehicle, or do I move off base and buy a vehicle, or, you know, it seems like they'd be contingent decision. Um, in El Paso, now, now, I think this is going to vary from installation to installation. Um, in El Paso, you could conceivably live off base and use public transportation. Um, but you're an army macho guy and you probably wouldn't do that. Um, can you live on base and have a vehicle? You can. You can live on base and have a vehicle. So, and, and I don't, we, I, I should go back and look at the data on that because we know whether they live on base or off base. So I should look at that. So yeah, maybe that some of this, some of these financial decisions are jointly made, so yeah. I got to figure out the rent and the car payment at the same time. Yeah. Um, keeping in mind, however, that most of these guys um, in AIT were living on base because of the, the they were only temporarily deployed there. Um, they were, um, they were, after AIT, most of them went either to Korea or Southwest Asia. They were almost immediately deployed. Well, I was just wondering if um, maybe you could say a little bit more about the, the instruction, the pedagogy that they used. I was impressed by, you know, what you said about the rationale for choosing uh, recently retired uh, military as instructors because they would really be able to identify with the situation and perhaps be able to answer questions that are really meaningfully, meaningful contextually. But um, 
Uh, did you get any insights into that or uh, about the effectiveness of the, um, the, the learner-teacher interaction or the, the way the content was actually delivered? Or um, I sat in on, on two sessions, two, two courses. Um, and in, they were different instructors, um, and both of them, it was very, very interesting. There was just a lot of empathy and respect. Um, empathy on the part of the instructor to the students, and respect from the part of the students toward the instructor. You could just sense that in the room. Um, there was a section in the, the course on identity and how important it is to um, you know, protect your social security number, protect your, your name, address, name, ranks or element kind of thing. And um, the, uh, the, the instructor was giving an example from his experience of, of um, seeing some um, documents with um, his own um, identifying information documents that were being, he was in Korea at the time, and it was documents that were being used as a, you know how you can take a, 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 a paper and, and, and make a container and, and you stuff stuff in it, and, and street food, and he had, I'm sorry if this grosses anybody out, but he'd gotten some chicken feet, and he was, he was eating his chicken feet, and he realized that these were his papers that he was eating it out of, street food vendor. Um, and so, and, and you know, so the again, the, the connection that people make with that was it was just those kinds of stories, you know, as if I were, you know, sitting as as a well intentioned as I might be as an instructor, I could never impart that kind of thing. And it was so I sensed that there was a lot of engagement. But the other thing I will say, it was seats and chairs. And when somebody got restless they would literally get up and walk and stand in the back of the class because they knew they were dropping off and they were not allowed to do that because you're in the army and you're not allowed to do that. Can you imagine if our classes did that? They would paper the students in the back of the room standing up. Anyway. Um, so it was all lecture-based pretty much? Yeah, I, you know, and I, again, I personally would have thought that if you could have done some small group projects, um, the other thing I will say is that um, in one of the, the two classes I saw, there were a number of um, reservists who had been called up to active duty. We did our surveys in 2006 to 2009, okay? And um, it was the, the, the run-up in Iraq, the run-up in Afghanistan, and, and um, uh, the reservists come in with a slightly different set of uh, financial education needs. They need to be knowing about how to keep their families going back in Iowa or Kansas or you know, Pennsylvania, um, more so than just how to um, sign up for the, the thrift savings plan kind of thing. So, so again, there, knowing your audience, I might have sort of said, you know, let's break the class up, and this group talk about buying a vehicle, and this group talk about financing your kid's college education, or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, I really would like to know who's got family support here. Uh, in other words, who has family support in the background. And then there's one really interesting thing. Your marriage results, uh, if you know this name probably, Danny Schneider. Forget about the wealth work with Tafano and Lozardi. Danny has, he's, this kid's coming out of graduate school next year, he's super. He has a paper who shows that people who have savings, people who are financially literate, people who aren't in debt are attractive partners. So the marriage is being, it's not that the marriage is causing you to save, it's that the saving and those characteristics are leading you, leading you to marriage. And I mean, this is, if you have a decent income or if you, are you know looking forward and have a low discount rate and understand you know you're not going to borrow and whatever those are the people that particularly in this group um, who are not going to college and so forth uh, that's who gets married so I'd be really be interesting twist to look at 
to, to try and see what you can get out of marriage patterns here. But the big thing that keeps coming back to me is, you know, is your family there to support, right? I mean, who takes care of, if it's the wife and kids back home, or, you know, again, we talked this morning about a bunch of kids coming from rural, disproportionately from rural areas, where there's liable to be more extended family support, I think, and so forth. So that, you know, there, there's a lot more I want to know. I mean, this, there's some teasing and interesting things here, but there's more. Um, and when in, in, um, in 2009, when we went back to, to collect the last round of data, um, our goal was we'd hoped to keep this project going a little bit longer, but um, the um, base realignment and closings, um, this AIT program moved out to Fort Sill, and, and things just started sort of dissolving on us, and we said, okay, got that signal, we're just not going to push this anymore. But um, in talking with the, um, the brigade officers about kind of what some of these, these family issues mm -hmm. that one of the things that, that um, I remember this one major telling me was, you know, I have got women in my unit who are single moms and my biggest problem is childcare and food stamps. And he said, I, the Army did not train me for this. I don't know what to do with these things. How do, I, how do I hook my female soldiers into the welfare system? And it's, again, sort of telling that we have to put our soldiers in the welfare system. That's Yes. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could just go back to that one slide where you've got your boxes, good and bad, and then the um, income scale. That one. OK. So the bump in E2, so E1 is the lowest income level. Right. So is this sort of a reflection of the fact that you get your first paycheck and year, you have money, and then you really got some discretionary money on E2, and you make some mistakes, and then you learn, and it's sort of like a, is there sort of a policy implication there that like if you reach those people before they get that first big bump up in mm -hmm. income, that you might really be able to, you know, bring that box back a little bit? Um, I think so. I mean, I, and I, you know, I think if if you think about sort of, and, and I, my hunch is that this is true, possibly even in the general population, that if you are really, really poor, you are pretty good at managing those nickels and dimes, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then you get just a little bit more money. You just get yep. over some sort yep. of inflection point, and that's when you can get into trouble. Yep. Prior to that, you're sort of too poor to get into trouble. And after that, you're, you've got enough resources that you don't get into trouble, but there's this middle yeah. middle place. So that's a, that's, that's well, and it just seems like there might be like a way to, if we could figure out when that exactly happens, whether it's age or, you know, if there might be. Yeah, you think about the rent to own example, right? That could be where you don't rent to own because you're too poor, but suddenly you have that, right? It's not really the best use of your money, but you see an opening of a door right. to things you didn't have before. You afford to rent to own. Yeah. Not to own. Yes. Well, we have effectively used up our time here, so very thank you very much. Thank you. Please join us for some refreshments, and Jane will be around for a bit.